And on today's show, why reviewing your client's life insurance portfolio is necessary. Part one of this week's series on the life insurance policy review of policy due diligence expert and certified financial planner, Sam Rokey. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Insmark, Life Specs, and Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show, Sam. Thanks, Steve. Sam, I'm looking at our first slide and I want to get into this. Some of you know that Sam is a really touted due diligence and due care expert on product review. This is all you do now. Mm -hmm. You just Correct. review policy. How many policies, I'm just kind of curious, a week does your team actually review? Yeah, we, we do about 1,200 reviews a year. A year? Yep. So you're doing 100 easy, right, yep. every month? Correct. How many people on your team? We have uh, seven of us total. So there are six full-time illustrators. Right. All they're doing is looking at policy reviews and numbers. Correct. This number stuns me that you have on your team, this has been going on for almost a decade, coming up with a number like this. You say that 65% of all cases reviewed actually end in a improvement to the case and many times a replacement of a case. Correct. So why is that? Uh, well, frankly, a lot of a lot of policies were were mispriced to begin with. They're underperforming. They're um, the, maybe the client was in the wrong underwriting mm -hmm. class to begin with. Um, so really, there are a lot of opportunities out there to improve policies to to put them in a better situation. Because frankly, things have gotten better. Mortality has improved, mm -hmm. um, uh, and products have gotten better. The carriers have gotten better at pricing them, um, and underwriting has gotten more specific. Those are those are the two big reasons, right? Now there. you just brought up underwriting. I know that. Uh, there's a there's an adage that I've been publishing. I have this in CNN that I just had an article get come out in CNN. I actually quoted uh, a, a substantial authority on an issue that 50% or more of Americans that hold life insurance are actually in the wrong rate class, which is a medical issue. Correct. How many of your cases that you see of 1,200 are usually a medical issue? We can improve it just on that issue alone. Yeah, I can't. I can't give you a specific number to that, but I would say it's a lot. There are there are tobacco issues. A lot of people have quit smoking over the mm -hmm. last several years, or maybe maybe they used uh, smokeless tobacco or smoked cigars, which ten years ago would have mm -hmm. been a, a tobacco rating. But um, today we can get them non-tobacco rates, which is going to substantially improve the pricing. Um, not to mention carrier's mortality assumptions have, have gotten better across the board. People are living longer, um, and in 1980, when, when a lot of these products were priced, um, the, the mortality assumptions were a lot more conservative than they are today. So if you had a client that was using some form of tobacco, this would be, that'd be a reason alone to look at. Dramatically, dramatically different, including weight loss. Um, diabetes is an issue where, you know, 10, 12 years ago you might have been declined or heavily rated, where today you might be able to get a standard rating or even a standard plus or preferred rating, depending on your on your situation. Mm -hmm. So, so not only do do some people just actually, frankly, get healthier, but um, some people also will will um, underwriting has caught up mm -hmm. to where. Uh, we can get them a better rate class than the, today than we could have 10 years ago just because underwriting is more mm -hmm. specific. How much li impact have life credits had on underwriting as well? Uh, huge, huge. I, frankly, a lot of the carriers have just gotten much more professional, much more specific. There's a lot more research out there on certain impairments and frankly carriers are, are always looking for an edge and so if they feel like they can price a certain mm -hmm. impairment better than the market um, due to something that they know that everybody else doesn't, um, they feel like that's a really good opportunity to get some market share. Well, now you've been talking about tobacco, medical issues, weight, different impairments specific, but what about product? Yep. You know, I mean, there's been changes. You remarked about the 1980 CSO. Even if the client was on a 2000 CSO, would I still look at it even if it was written early in the 2000s? Um, absolutely, you would, um, mm -hmm. because mortality has gotten better even since then. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, a lot of policies that were put in place in the early 2000s um, were put in place under um, higher interest rate assumptions. Um, so, you know, as interest rates have gone down, those policies typically have underperformed, and now the market ha offers guaranteed solutions mm -hmm. um, and, and leaner, lower cost scenarios. And, and frankly, some of those policies have just gotten to a place where they are underperforming so much mm. that it's to catch up is a, just a, a, a very difficult process and it makes sense to transition them to a new product. Now I've noticed that besides the underwriting when you're talking about product, many times you can increase the benefit for the client right. if that's the strategy or in reverse actually lower the premium commitment. 
Correct. Now, which one do you see the client usually take? I mean, just I, mean, I kind of know the answer, the, but I'm curious from yeah, your the, standpoint. The typical, the typical is to either reduce or eliminate the premium. A lot we, we've done a lot in the past with just totally eliminating premiums. A lot of mm -hmm. clients say, "Look, I'm in, an, in a phase of my life where um, I don't want to pay this premium anymore. I'm content just taking what I've put into it, leveraging it uh, to the max that I can leverage it, and 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 simply letting it go." Um, and utilizing their cash flow for, for a lifestyle or for, for mm -hmm. other outlets. And you've seen many clients actually qualify so they don't have to pay ongoing premium anymore. Correct. Well, see, Correct. to me, that's, that's a huge, huge benefit. So even if you're just looking, this is a great prospecting tool, too. I could see purpose, people saying, I'd even write this client, but I'm going to have it reviewed anyways. Now, we could also look through different underwriting. As you said, there could be cases that once were declined in the past that are now rated or even with lifestyle credits yeah. and shaving programs could be improved. Uh, also, I just think about, I'm thinking about loan provisions. Usually mm -hmm. people have loans. Is that an issue? Oh, that's a huge issue. Loan, loans are a huge issue and, and a lot of times we're able to, to kind of come up with a strategy to mitigate the loan. Mm -hmm. A lot of old whole life contracts have a, have a loan provision that's like an 8% mm -hmm. interest rate. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the, that loan value is, is really blowing up on mm -hmm. them and they need to come up with a solution otherwise they're going to have a big tax problem down the road mm -hmm. um, and uh, ultimately their, their, their policy isn't going to do what they want it to do. We come back from the break, we're going to talk more about why you should look at a policy review on an annual basis. It could really help your client and actually increase your compensation. It's not how much money you make for your clients, it's how much money they get to keep, especially in retirement. But retirement income could cause Social Security benefits to be taxed. One tax advantage alternative is life insurance designed as a non-modified endowment contract that can generate tax-free income without taxing Social Security benefits. These contracts offer differing funding options depending upon your client's risk tolerance. For more information on how life insurance can be part of your retirement planning, just email me at steve at downtobusiness.tv. Brought to you by Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. We're with Sam Roki. Sam, you're a due diligence and a due care expert. You're a certified financial planner. One of the big things that I am shocked that's on the top of your list, and it tops your list, is we have to determine if the actual strategy that was originally deployed is still right. in vogue today. Right. How many times is that actually true? Uh, it's a lot more than you'd think. Uh, one of the biggest issues we see is that over 20% uh, of policies that are a few years old um, either have a, a beneficiary who is a, either divorced or deceased spouse. Um, so a lot of times the beneficiary designation is just wrong um, and people really have no idea. They don't have any idea who it is or if they do, they haven't really thought, oh, I should probably change that. Now, now see, I get that, the change, but, but what about the strategy? Like the person actually put this in for an indemnification strategy, maybe it was a business deal where mm -hmm. they both were, you know, associates were indemnifying each other. Is that change the actual planning strategy? Yeah, a, lo a lot of times, yeah, wow. the, the, the buy-sell agreement is out of date or the buy they, they don't need it anymore and they're not really sure what to do with it. So I, things change. I, you know, If I look at my life five, ten years ago, it's a whole lot different than it is today. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true with almost everybody. And so um, just reviewing their policy, looking at it and saying, okay, why do I have this? Mm -hmm. What purpose is it, is it giving me today? Um, and how can I maximize this going forward? I have a list from Beckham Technician on life events which is really appropriate and it really watches and monitors the changes in your life. If you just write me, I'll be happy to do uh, give it to you. It's really a good thing. I use it for a good map to plot. But I am blown away a little bit that so many of the strategies are not in vogue any longer as well as you said, no beneficiaries changes, wrong ownership. A lot of issues like that. How many, but what about the docs? I, we do a lot of business, we do a lot of business strategies and a lot of business insurance. Are there a lot of buy-sell agreements? Are there a lot of cross-purchase? Or do they just have the insurance and no documentation? Um, there's typically a buy-sell or, or the documentation, but a lot of times it's just wrong or it's bad. It has a, an mm -hmm. old formula in there that needs to be reviewed. And we have outlets where, where we can get uh, an insurance company's legal counsel to, to go in and actually review the buy-sell document for you. Mm -hmm. So th there's, a, there's a huge value in just being able to, to go in and have somebody who's a professional mm -hmm. take a look at it and say, okay, here are some things you need to think about and you need to really understand. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, there are a lot of buy-sells that just aren't funded. Well, now, when I think about not fund, non-funded, this isn't going to really do anything. Right. And on top of that, what about the buy-sell evaluations? I mean, businesses change, 
and some of these businesses haven't been evaluated in five, some up mm -hmm. to a decade. Yeah. How much of that do you see? Uh, well, there, there's, there's a lot of that, and one, one of the, the other alternatives we have in the market, or options we have in the market, is to um, informally value a, an insur or a, a, a company. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a carrier that will help us do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not a, it's not formal. It's not something. It's not binding, but it gives the, the, the owner of the business a really good idea of what his company is worth. I'm looking at this other provision that you talk about provisions and benefits within an existing policy. Right. There could be riders, there could be specs inside the contract. Give me an example of something that you would see on a regular basis that you say, wow, I need to clarify, is that provision really what they really wanted? Or if it is in vogue, if it's still being used, is it appropriate? And is there another carrier that has a better benefit for the same dollar? Right, there, there, there is a good bit of that. Honestly, the biggest opportunity in the market right now um, is is adding value to the contract, um, and and the the major uh, the major feature that's out there that these days that wasn't out there 10, 15 years ago are long-term care riders, and long-term care is mm -hmm. um, is something that a lot of people are very cognizant of. Um, they're they're beginning to look. Um, and say, hey, I really need long-term care coverage. What if I can take my life insurance contract and, and use it as a pool of long-term care money where if I don't need it, it goes to my family, mm -hmm. but if I do need it, I can use it for long-term care. And so um, insurance contracts have just gotten better in that mm -hmm. respect. They're, they're more flexible. They have more opportunities where some of these old contracts are just death benefit or just death benefit with some cash value. Are these contracts that have these riders, are those riders embedded in the contract or do you actually have to pay extra for those riders? It depends. Some carriers it's embedded and some mm. carriers it is you, you pay a little extra for it. We actually recommend typically that you do pay extra for it because when you do take benefits on at the back end, the benefit, your death benefit is reduced dollar for dollar. Mm -hmm. Whereas some of those embedded free riders, mm -hmm. um, those those do typically reduce the death benefit much more than dollar for dollar, depending on an actuarial factor, depending on the interest rate at the time that you can't really predict. So there's a lot to look at if we want to add additional value. There really is, yeah. What about this issue? We just went through AG38 a couple years ago. I thought the whole guaranteed universal life issue was pretty much put to bed. Right. But you say many people are looking for secondary guarantees, and do we still have carriers from a replacement point of view or an improvement policy point of view that you would look at from a GUL point of view? Yes, absolutely. It, the, the GUL market has gotten more expensive um, mm -hmm. as interest rates have been extremely low and AG38 um, came in. A lot of carriers had to reprice uh, for, for both of those reasons. Um, we're finding now that, that it seems to be more interest rate driven than, mm -hmm. than reserving um, and a lot of carriers are still very committed to the market and uh, honestly consumers just like a guarantee. They like to know that if I put in this, I'm going to get this. Um, and they may have been stung in the past with policies that were that were promised or projected mm -hmm. one way and then kind of blew up and we have to come back 10 to 15 years later and say, based on these current assumptions, current projections, your policy is going to blow up at age 85 or 83. Um, something that is, is a tough conversation to have with a client um, and that's not a lot of fun. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker-dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? Just hop out to our video archives. And remember, you could be wiser as an educated advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you.